Seeker, written by Susanna Thompson, performed by Heather Firth. Chapter 13 That man is a criminal, Silas states as we are waiting outside Jack's office building for the taxi he called for us. If I hadn't already suspected as much from our conversation with the man... The fact that he had a thousand dollars cash to give us as an advance on Silas's inheritance would have stirred up uneasy suspicions in my mind. You're lucky he thinks you are too, I tell him. I don't think he would have helped us otherwise. Why did you tell him that Abel's a priest? He questions. And what kind of man was this benefactor, Robert? I don't want to discuss this out here on the sidewalk even though no one is near us at the moment. Forget about that now. I need to teach you how to use a computer. You'll need to know that for school. I was planning to take him directly to Jack's apartment, but I give the driver my address when the taxi arrives. We spend an hour on my computer as I show Silas the basics of logging in, internet browsing, typing and saving a file, and logging off. I'll show you more stuff next time. But we need to go shopping, I tell him. Since he has no small bills, I pay for yet another taxi. I reply to mom's text about how I'm doing, and I decide that Silas needs to buy a phone too. We go back to the same store where I bought his pajama pants, and only then do I realize that we forgot them at my house. It's one of those superstores that sells everything, so we're able to get groceries for him as well as a starter wardrobe and the cell phone. The total cost is not too bad, considering how many items he purchased. But I still worry about his money situation. That doesn't prevent me from using his money to pay for the next taxi, however. I'm not exactly rich myself. Jack's apartment is much nicer than I expected. The gleaming kitchen is filled with expensive-looking appliances, but the fridge contains only a couple bottles of wine. I guess he wasn't exaggerating about rarely being here. He must pay a maid service to keep the place so spotlessly clean, though. I wonder where he lives and why he keeps an apartment he hardly ever uses. Whatever the reason, it's a blessing for Silas to have somewhere to stay. I checked the bus routes from this address while we were on my computer, And I was relieved to know that Silas could take the public bus to school if he needs to. Paying for taxis all the time would get expensive. I show him which groceries go in the fridge and which ones belong in the freezer. We stock the cereal boxes on top of the refrigerator. And I explain how to pour milk in a bowl and eat cereal out of it with a spoon. I also instruct him how to toast the waffles he likes so much. Then I tell him to go change out of my dad's clothes so that I can take them home with me. Silas looks like a normal teenager when he returns from the bedroom, wearing jeans and a t-shirt. The jeans are a classic blue and the t-shirt is white. I avoided picking out black clothing for him, but I have to admit that black really suited his dark looks. Studying him now with his silky black hair, dark eyes, and sharp cheekbones makes me see why all those girls approached him with their phone numbers. He's a little too skinny, but he's got a very attractive face now that he no longer has that creepy blank expression. Is this all right? He asks. I stop staring at him. Yeah, you'll fit in okay at school. I'll be able to go there soon, he says with happy anticipation. Yeah, it's great, I remark dryly. I'll have a purpose, he continues, apparently missing the lack of enthusiasm in my tone. I hadn't ever thought of it that way. Attending school was something I was forced to do, although it wasn't so bad when I was there with my friends. Since they died, there was nothing for me to look forward to at school. I had gone to the library during lunch, rather than facing the depressing prospect of seeing our usual lunch table with four empty chairs. Would anybody else sit where they had sat every day? I hadn't wanted to find out. 
Thinking about that makes me wonder who Silas will sit with. According to what Jack said, his paperwork will show his age as nearly 18, so I assume he'll be a senior. Since lunch in my school is separated by grades, he won't have the same lunch period as me. He won't even be in any of my classes. So there wasn't much point in him insisting on going to the same school with me. I don't want to discourage him, so I don't mention any of that to him. Okay, we're going to put your phone to charge, and then you're going to make your lunch. I'll show you how to text tomorrow. I picked out a prepaid phone for him that he could just load with more minutes when he needed them, since I didn't think he'd be using his phone much at first. After taking out one of the frozen meals we bought at the store out of the freezer, I guide him step by step on heating it up in the microwave. The directions are on the back of the package in case you forget. When it's done, I have him put on an oven mitt to remove the hot container out of the microwave. Let that cool off for a minute. I lead him into the living room and teach him how to use the TV remote. Be careful not to drop any food on his couch if you eat in here. I pack my dad's clothes in one of the empty shopping bags from the store. I'll come over after school tomorrow and show you how to use the bus. Aren't you going to eat? He asks after I call for a taxi. I'm spending a fortune on them. But it should be the last one I'll need for a while. I have to go home, I reply. I'm supposed to be sick. He doesn't look as forlorn as yesterday when I left him at the store, but I'm still moved to reassure him. I'll leave you my number in case. You'll have to ask one of the neighbors to use their phone, but only call me if it's an emergency. I don't want him to mess with his phone because I want to make sure it's fully charged for tomorrow. There's no house phone in the apartment, so he can't call me that way. Searching through my purse yields no pen or paper. We forgot to get you school supplies, I exclaim. I'll lend you some of mine until you can get your own. I pull my lipstick out of my purse and walk into the bedroom in search of a mirror on the dresser. Oddly, the headboard of the bed is also a mirror, and there is a mirrored ceiling above the bed. Weird, I remark and turn to write my phone number on the dresser mirror. Writing my phone number with lipstick makes me feel like a romantic character in a movie. But the feeling turns strange when I catch Silas's gaze in the mirror. I break eye contact as I spin toward the doorway and walk out of the room. Your food's probably cooled off enough to eat, I tell him as he walks behind me into the living room. I've got to get downstairs so I won't miss the taxi. I turn to face him then. Don't open the door to anyone except me. I demonstrate how to lock the deadbolt. Lock it behind me and stay here. You've got everything you need, so don't go anywhere. I'll stay here, he promises. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow, I say and open the door to leave. He stands in the doorway and watches me as I step out into the hallway. I wave at him, and he waves back. When he makes no move to close the door, I tell him to do so. Make sure you lock it. I remind him. I wait until I hear the deadbolt click into place before heading toward the elevator. Silas was okay by himself in the store last night, so he should be fine behind a locked door. Maybe it's just our encounter with the shady Jack Cole that's got me so nervous. But he wouldn't do anything to Silas, I try to assure myself. I skip lunch, and I have no appetite for dinner. Mom worries that I'm still not feeling better. Maybe I should take you to the doctor tomorrow. No, I protest. I'm fine, really. I want to go back to school tomorrow. If only I had some way to contact Silas, I think. Just to know that he's okay. As nerve-wracking as last night was, this is worse. How will I get through the whole night not knowing if Silas is in danger? Jack had no problem associating with a hitman. What if he's a killer, too? April, I say when I'm alone in my room. Do you know if Silas is okay? 
There is no response from Abel. He doesn't appear in my room to answer me, and I wonder if he's gone for good. It appears that he left Silas on his own after getting him involved in this mess. I pace around as I debate whether I should sneak out again tonight after my parents go to sleep. I'll just go check on Silas and come right back. But what if something's already happened to him? Terrible thoughts of finding him murdered run through my mind. The alert that I've received a text message distracts me from my horrible rumination. Who could it be? All my friends are dead. You didn't answer my question about the benefactor. What kind of man was he? I stare at the text in disbelief. Silas? Yes, it is me. I send a reply. You know how to text? Yes. It was explained in the telephone manual. I laugh in relief and happiness. You're okay? Yes. There is no emergency. You said to call if there was. I assumed texting was acceptable to you if there is no emergency. Thank God, I think gratefully. I'm glad you figured it out. I was worried about you. I am all right. Tell me about Robert. What did Abel say about him? I'm so relieved that Silas is okay, I don't even think about my reply. He was a hitman. My benefactor murdered people? The problem with text messages is that they are mostly devoid of emotion. I'm not sure how Silas is taking this news. He wanted to do a good deed for you to make up for it. You should have told me this before. I would not have gone to meet that criminal today. His mention of Jack makes me nervous again, as I remember his warning about using technology to communicate. Delete these texts. I must return the money he gave me. I can't believe he's even suggesting doing that. You can't. You need that money. I don't have enough to take care of you. I will find employment. I am quickly becoming annoyed with him. You can't do anything without his help. Delete these texts and shut up. There is no response from him after my harsh reply, but I send him one more text that evening. Keep the door locked. Don't let anyone but me in. Sleep is very slow in coming to me that first night that we're apart. I wake an hour before my alarm is supposed to go off, and I immediately text Silas. Are you okay? When he doesn't respond, I call him. His voice sounds sleepy when he answers. Mila? Go back to sleep, I tell him. I'll see you later. I snuggle back under the covers and fall into sweet slumber, until my alarm ends my rest too soon. Despite not getting enough sleep again, I have a brighter outlook today. Nothing bad happened to Silas, and he's going to be okay. Not everyone in my life is doomed.